Welcome to our series, Church in History, Session 4. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. As we continue our series, Church in History, one of the things to keep in mind when I'm really talking about is church in history. It's not taking the church and saying, this is the history of the church. It is the history of the church. But I'm trying to show what's happening, that how history is also affecting the way the church developed and the steps the church takes in developing. The church exists in history, which means that whatever is happening in history, the church takes its theology, takes its way of thinking, takes the Gospels, and applies them to the present day. So if we look back now to the beginnings of the church, we find out that the church in history is really shaped by all the things that were happening back at the time after the resurrection of Christ. So we looked back and we went through all the developments, how the emperors themselves sometimes persecuted the church, sometimes did not persecute the church. And finally, we came down to the time of Constantine. Constantine, he was the sole emperor after a period of four emperors leading the Roman Empire. He had defeated them all or they lost in some form, but he wound up as the one sole emperor of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was vast. And what was happening in the Roman Empire is what the church had to respond to. The church had to keep Jesus' doctrine and apply it to what was going on in the church at the time. And so what we saw was that Constantine, he reigned about the year 306 to 337. During that time, the church changed a great deal. Actually, the empire changed a great deal. Back at the time of Dacius, one of the emperors who ruled around the year 300, he was one who wanted to bring the empire back together again. He saw it disintegrating. That was his idea. And he thought to himself, well, at one time we had the glory days. The glory days that really held the empire together, basically by our pagan faith, our common beliefs. At the time, we see the beginning of the church. At that time, church and state were not separate. The church, actually faith, was a belief that held everything together. The faith happened to be a pagan faith. And it was a faith that believed in many gods, a faith that believed the emperor was a god. So it was that kind of a faith. So the emperor now in the year 300, and 250 actually even earlier, he could look back and he could say the empire at one time was being held together by a common belief. And now we're disintegrating. And they're disintegrating because they have many challenges, historical challenges. And so he wants to bring it all together. And he says, what we really should do is to increase the idea of living more faithfully to our paganism, to faith, face paganism in a full way. So what does he do? He says everybody in the empire has to offer sacrifice to the gods. Christians, of course, refuse to offer this sacrifice. And he passed a law, the law that said if you don't offer sacrifices, you're going to be killed. You'll be deprived of any form of work. Eventually, you'll have nowhere to go. And so he punished those 
who refused to sacrifice. Many people did sacrifice. Many people turned to pagan gods. They would get a certificate that would say they sacrificed. And this went on for several emperors, under several, several emperors. Diocletian, for instance, was one of the worst. He really enforced the law very strictly. But he finally broke the empire down to four parts. And after a period of time, there were four emperors, and one by one, they disappeared from the scene. Finally, we're left with Constantine. That's a review, really, of what we've been speaking about all along. All along. But what this points, to, uh, points out to us is that the church was developing in response to historical needs. And so we see what's happening. And one of the things we have to keep in mind, the empire was vast. And some of the things that were happening in the West in part of the empire were not affecting the East. They were so far apart. How do they communicate? Communication was carried on mainly by the trades, by the traders who would carry what they heard here over to what they heard over there. And also, too, the empire didn't have individual states within it. The truth. We believe that Jesus is God. But then we have doctrine. Doctrine is explaining that dogma. And what doctrine often had to do was to develop new words to explain this. For instance, we had three persons in one God. We know, we believe that as Christians. But as we read the Gospels, there's no word in the Gospels that says Trinity. The development of the idea <clears throat> of Trinity, to explain it, that's what doctrine does. Doctrine tells us there's a Trinity here it's not mentioned in the Gospels, not mentioned even in the Scripture. However, we explain it because in history, it began to have more of a meaning. It was explaining the basic dogma. Keeping that in mind, we'll be talking about some of the early councils of the church, saying they were trying to preserve the dogma, the teachings that we find in the Scripture. And at the same time, they had to explain it to each era of history. Doctrine did that. It explained it to each era in history. And some of it became very solid in the beginning. They became the foundation for the next historical generation. So you see now, for instance, <clears throat> we have Constantine. He reigned or came into power about the year 306, or he was born in 306. But he reigned around that time. Excuse me, he, was, he reigned at that period. He reigned from 306 to 337. His reign was one that changed everything. Christians had been persecuted up to the time that he became the emperor. Now, he made Christianity the favored religion. And so what happens was, he wanted to unite the kingdom. He wanted to unite the kingdom under one belief. That's the way they did things back in those days. They united everything under a single belief if they could, a way of thinking. And so it was always religious. Religion was central to the people's way of thinking. As someone once said today, we might go down to the store and talk about how, how much a loaf of bread has gone up, how the price has changed. In those days, they would go down and they would say, well, how can Jesus be divine? Their discussions would be more religious. Ours are more economical because history has changed. They would talk about perhaps the cost of things. But basically back in Jesus' day or back in the days of the early church, they would talk about religious items. Religion was very central. Belief was very central. So Constantine got the idea of uniting the kingdom under Christianity. Instead of uniting it under paganism, they would unite it under Christianity. <clears throat> so that was his idea. And what he did was, as time went on, 
He favored the church, favored Christianity, a complete switch. The church went from persecution to favor to being a favorite church. Christianity now became a favorite. And what Constantine did, he gave basilicas to the church. He bestowed favors upon the church. He gave them palaces to the leaders. He actually built new places of worship for the church. And what he did also, he declared that Sunday was a public holiday. Sunday, Christians celebrate as the day of Christ's resurrection. It's a very special day. Some in writing about the liturgy of the early church said that every Sunday was an Easter. Every Sunday celebrated Christ's resurrection. Constantine, he built the basilica over the tomb of Peter. We see how that has flowered and developed down through the centuries. So things began to change under Constantine. He bestowed many favors on the clergy. He freed the clergy from taxation. That was a big thing in those days because taxation was heavy on the people. He had to tax a great deal, or Rome did, in order to support the empire in its many wars, trying to protect themselves against the barbarians. Christians were exempted from the military. The clergy were given places of honor. So now we begin to see where the clergy becomes a political group almost, where they're serving as government leaders as well as religious leaders. Even to the bishops, the leaders, their garb changed. The pointed hat for the bishop, that came in at this era because government officials wore that pointed hat. And that was a sign of the authority. So all these things were coming on into church practice. The church was developing because of what history was doing. And then what happened too, is that eventually Constantine began to realize that the more powerful part of the empire was in the East. He was in Rome, Rome was in the West, the Western part of the empire. The Eastern part of the empire was much stronger. In today's world, it seems to us like the West is very strong. But in the time of Constant Constantinople and Constantine, it was really the East that was strong. So he moved to Byzantium, which would later be called Constantinople. He gave the Lateran Palace to the Pope, a very magnificent palace in those days. He gave it to the Pope, and the Popes lived or served there. So around the year 1300. So it was a gift that lasted many centuries. And then also the clergy now began to become separate from the people, a development in history. Now that they were leaders, now that they were government leaders, they would have a separation from the people in many cases. The clergy now began to become separated into bishop, presbyter, deacon. In the beginning, there's usually one bishop, that single bishop, he would celebrate Eucharist. Others would gather around. He had deacons to help him. So they had the order of deacons beginning. These deacons would prepare everything for the bishop. They would go out after the liturgy, the bishop's liturgy. He would send the Eucharist out to many of the people who weren't able to be there for the Eucharist. So the deacons would take it out to the different highways and byways. They had that process. And then also the presbyters, they were the ones who eventually would be sent out to celebrate the liturgies in these countrysides. It was developing because of need. The idea being the church wanted to reach out, but it needed some kind of an organization. Also, when they read back in history, one of the problems they run into sometimes is that in many of the writers, they used these names of bishop, 
presbyter and deacon interchangeably. They would be called, grouped together, perhaps called the elders. The elders comes from the Jewish leadership idea that the Jewish leaders were all called elders. So these would be the elders. Very gradually, it developed in different parts, little here, little there, into the bishop. The word bishop means supervisor. He supervised everything. Then eventually, the deacon, who was so important to the bishop, he was the one really that helped the deacon, the bishop. Sometimes she would be the one to help the bishop. And so we had deaconesses and deacons. And so they would be the helpers. Very often, a new bishop would be selected from among the deacons because they were the ones most familiar with the running of the particular areas. But then, as I said, as I said, when they started going out to the countryside, they now had to start to ordain presbyters to celebrate in the countryside. This was in major sections, but it was done differently in different parts until history gradually brought it all together. It was always somehow or other in the guidance of the Holy Spirit, always seemed to lead back to the apostles or their successors. And so the church did keep that apostolic succession, but developed also the different offices within the church. The offices that Constantine set up, they were the ones who continued on down through the ages, but they also developed in time. And we'll see the development of everything from the Pope to Bishop to all of the offices within the church down to the laity. And even the effect the laity had upon the history of the church. So the church was enveloped in, in taken into history. And history had a great influence on the church. So what happened now as time went on, persecution. They rejected the faith. They were what's called apostates. An apostate, that was a person who once believed but no longer believes. And now all these apostates, they came back and they repented after the persecution stopped. And as time went on, there was different people beginning to interact and bishops came back. And the bishops who were apostates had repented and now continued to act with the power of the bishop. In Carthage, there was someone, a bishop, who was ordained a bishop. They always had two bishops who would ordain the third. He was ordained a bishop by bishops who had apostatized and who came back, repented. So they chose this bishop, and he was now accepted as the bishop by most of the people. But there was a group that didn't accept him. And the group that didn't accept him, they ordained their own bishop. They said, once somebody apostatizes, gives up the faith, even under torture, that person loses his power. And so they say the bishop can no longer do it. The bishop who apostatizes, he can no longer use his power in that direction. So the ordination of that bishop, the first one of Carthage, was illegal. So now they set up their own bishop named Donatus. That was his name. And so the heresy that's going to come from this is called Donatism. Really began around the year 311. But what's happening now, we now have two bishops and we now have two separate groups. We have the people who are followers of Donatus and people who are followers of the church. And the idea of another church almost that Donat, 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 Donatus was establishing is called a schism. A schism occurs when part of the church breaks away from another part of the church. It's a schism, a cutting. It follows many of the ways of acting of the church, but denies a major rule. In this case, the schism, they act out, they continue with liturgies, they have their bishops, 
but they cut themselves off from their unity with the rest of the church. So it's a schism. And the idea behind this now was Donatus, he caused a problem. And Donatism now began as a very powerful force in the kingdom. One of the things that began to happen is that Constantine saw this developing. Well, he thought he could take care of it. He would simply wipe out the Donatists. So he would send armies sometimes to wipe them out. Armies to protect against Donatism. Anybody who was a Donatist really risked the loss of many of the privileges held by Christianity. And he would send troops in to solve that problem, to get rid of the Donatists. But it didn't work. It caused more problems. And so he wasn't successful. It's one of the early times when Constantine tried to keep the kingdom together. He saw that what was happening is that this religious separation was causing separation within the empire. It would not be good for a united empire. And so what happens now is that he had to face this feat and he had to accept the Donatists as part of his kingdom, which is what he did. So he accepted them with a decree of toleration. That's what it was called, a decree of toleration. What Constantine learned is that he cannot always change the idea of heresies simply by force. And there was another item over in Alexandria, Egypt. What was happening there that there was a ordained priest named Arius. He was a teacher. Probably, he lived, he was born about 250. He lived to the year 336. So it was still in the early centuries. And Arius, he was with someone who was teaching heresy. He eventually leaned on the heresy and says, you know, Jesus was created before the world. Yes, maybe. But Jesus was created created by God, he did not always exist. There was a time when he did not, a time when he was not. And then God created the second person, Jesus. So we have now Jesus created before the world. Then God gave to this creature the power to create many of the things in creation. All things were created through him. Arius could accept that, but he couldn't accept that, that the Lord, that Jesus, was the second person that was God. So he's saying, no, if, if Jesus was God, then there'd be two gods. So his thinking hadn't developed as it has, as we learned down later on, for a council. Councils are a gathering of the bishops. It speaks with authority as long as it's delegated by the Pope or at least approved by the Pope. So, for instance, now they had to have a council to solve this problem. They tried to solve it locally in the synod, they call it, a group of bishops from the area. And they would get from the area there. They would come together. In Alexandria, Arius' idea, he said there was a time when Jesus, that God, that Jesus was not. Jesus was created. And because he was a created, he was a creature like us, although more powerful than us, because that's the creature that God created. The local council in Egypt at Alexandria, they excommunicated Arius. And recognizing that he was excommunicated, when someone was excommunicated, they ran the danger of being killed. That's how close religion and the government was. Arius had to flee because if the bishop became so powerful against him, the people would perhaps want to kill him. So he fled. 
And he went from there to Palestine. In Palestine, somehow he again was able to gather people to follow to his teaching. The bishops of Palestine, they had a synod, a group being a local bishops. They accepted Arius' teaching. He was exonerated in, in Palestine. Once he was accepted by a synod, he felt he could now go back. So he went back to Alexandria. He returned to Alexandria and began and continued his teaching. At Alexandria, the belief now set one group against another. They were so strong in their beliefs that it caused riots. Riots of the Aryan group versus the group that is faithful to the teaching of the church from the beginning. So now we have Arianism becoming very powerful and at the same time causing many riots. Alexander, the Bishop of Alexandria, he died and a man named Athanasius took his place. Athanasius was a deacon, but he was chosen as bishop. And he became the one who would confront Arius about his teaching. In the meanwhile, they had to talk about, well, how can we say as a church that Arius is wrong? And so they established an ecumenical council. Ecumenical council means a council of all the bishops of the church. They went to Nicaea. That way it was close to where the emperor could keep an eye on things. Constantine could keep an eye on things. By this time, Constantine realized he himself could not simply mandate that everybody believes this or that. He needed the support of the bishops. And so what happened in Nicaea, 300 bishops gathered together. But from among that number, there was only five from the West. The rest were from the East. Constantinople to the end of the empire in the east. In the west, there were five. Two of them were delegates from the Pope, which left three other bishops there to present a certain way of thinking. They had an acceptable way of thinking. During the Council of Nicaea, 325, they came up with the idea that Jesus was one in being with the Father. He was not separate. He was not created by the Father, by God. He is one with God. And so that's what the council said, one in being with the Father. We say now consubstantial, of the same substance. In those days, they didn't speak in that same kind of language, but some, some did. In those days, too, philosophy had a great deal of influence on the thinking of the people. However, at the Council of Nicaea, Arianism was condemned. And so now Arius had to find security with others. So he had the Arian controversy. It went on for a while. St. Athanasius, who was exempt, as I mentioned, he was eventually made Bishop of Alexandria. He was a strong advocate of the church's teaching. A conflict with Arius brought him into conflict sometimes with the emperors. He had to go into exile five times. Every time he was sent into exile, then the emperor would say, well, you know, the teaching of the church, we'll go with that. And he could come back. The fifth time, there was a riot. They, people rebelled. They wanted him back. And so the emperor had to allow him to come back. The emperors themselves, sometimes they were Arians. Sometimes they accepted the church's teaching. So Athanasius, he became a great advocate of the idea of the teaching of the church that Jesus was God become human. So he was welcomed back, and he had strong support. Then there were, as I said, relatives of Constantine. He died, of course, eventually. And there were some who came into power, 
emperors, and they, they would persecute the Christians, short time. And there were others, like the writers in the church, who now began to teach in a very scientific way, in a sense, more intellectual ideas as they gathered it from the scripture. Doctrine was developing, and the teaching of the church was being explained more fully in the language of the era. And so that's how the doctrine was being developed. So we had, for instance, Julian, a man named Julian the Apostate. The Apostate. He was one who apostatized. He was a great thinker, but then what happened was under the pressure, he denied the faith. And then we had martyrs among those who taught about the faith. Many martyrs. So it was a persecution that went on. One of the things about Julian to show the difference, we now not only wound up with Rome on the, in the West and Constantinople and others in the East, it was also a way of thinking. The East had more of a tendency to side with Greek culture. The West, more Roman culture. And so the difference was they even thought differently. Their basis of thinking was a little different. So that was one of the things that was happening. And picture the whole empire now. It wasn't as united as we are today. Communication didn't happen in an instant as it happens today. And so things developed in certain areas. There were no states. There were no real nations that could say, this is our nation. This is France. What was happening is that there were tribes, but there wasn't that unity that could identify certain areas as a full state. So because of all of that, the development had to happen in one place and very gradually move to others. Even liturgy developed in the same way, although much of the liturgy received its power when it was eventually celebrated in Rome. And then it would go out from Rome with a certain way, common way of being celebrated by the whole church. So we have all of that. And finally, we come down to Theodosius I. Theodosius I, towards the end of the 300s, he declared that Christianity was the, was the religion of the state, the official religion. And so it was the official belief everything would be based on Christianity. In some cases, in some areas, if a person didn't accept Christianity, they'd be persecuted. Persecution almost changed in some areas. He ordered the acceptance of the creed. The creed at that time would be a creed that was still developing. At Nicaea, they came up with a creed. It's a creed that was shared for the whole church as much as possible spread gradually throughout the church. So it was a creed that was accepted, and Theodosius said it had to be accepted by everyone. Theodosius, he condemned Arianism. And by condemning Arianism, he also ran into problems because there were many powerful rulers who were now Arian. So the church continues to develop. Arianism carries on, and then we carry on to other needs, begin to have other heresies arising. Another heresy that arises is the heresy of some saying, well, is Jesus really divine? Yes. Is Jesus really human? Now we come to a different case. We're talking about the humanness of Jesus. How human is Jesus? So Jesus is divine, but is, is he simply divine? And the idea being that what some would say, he was divine, but in this divinity, he took upon himself or entered into a human being. So he really wasn't human. He appeared to be human. And some began to follow that idea that he wasn't really human. 
but only appeared to be eunuch. And so the Council of Nicaea had strongly defended the divinity of Jesus. But now we had to go through other kinds of teachings. There was a man named Eutyches. He tried to say, this is how Jesus can be human and divine. They had to explain that. He wound up with a heresy, a heresy that said it appeared to be human, and he was condemned. Then there was another man named Nestorius. Nestorius, he was one who began to teach. Well, you know, Mary was not really the mother of Jesus of God. Mary was the mother of the human Jesus. To say that, we would have to separate the persons of Jesus. So the council began to talk about that. They had to say there are really two natures in Jesus, a human nature and a divine nature in one person, the one person of Jesus. And so Jesus was human. Jesus was divine. Nestorius denied that. He was saying Jesus wasn't wasn't uh, human. Or rather, he, he simply was a divine person who now was simply looked human. Even some of the pra practices that came from that that affected us later on. There was a heresy called monophysitism. Monophysitism talked about the idea that once Jesus became human, the presence of God in Jesus was so powerful that it overwhelmed the humanness. And so it overwhelmed the humanness of Jesus. As a result of that, even down to our present age, we kind of use the idea that when Jesus walked this earth, it was as though God simply zippered up this human form and walked it. It's as though God was Jesus reading minds, not acting as a human being, but imitating to be like a human being. And so many began to say, well, Jesus, he was God. He could know everything. Jesus himself denied knowing everything. All of these gospel truths had to be understood in some way, had to be explained. The first seven councils of the church, of Christianity, each one of them had something to do with an understanding of Jesus. They're called the Christological, the Christological Councils. And the Christological Councils, they had to talk about the idea, well, Jesus, yes, he is human and divine. He has two natures. Once that was accepted, then someone came along with the idea, well, did Jesus have two wills? In other words, when Jesus acted, was it always God's will that he was following? Or did he have a human will? Did he have to choose? The scriptures say he was like us in every way except sin. It doesn't say he couldn't sin. It said he didn't sin. Jesus had a human will to will what he wanted to do because his human will enabled him as a human being to worship God and trust God. So now we went through the idea now, well, did he really have a human will? And the answer, of course, was what we eventually came up with in Jesus, two natures in one person, and the idea of, yes, a human will and a divine will. It's confusing because it's difficult for us to think about all of that with a limited human mind. But what the councils of the church and the early church had to keep coping with was an understanding of Jesus. It wasn't simply just saying, well, the church comes together, comes up with an idea, says, explain, this is what every Christian is meant to believe, and then goes on. It caused riots. It caused fights. It caused uprisings. It caused lives. All because of beliefs. The idea of separation of church and state that's something that really didn't exist almost until the United States existed. They all very often saw some kind of a link 
between religion and the government. It began back with Constantine and developed down through history. And all the while, what the church had to do was to try to help people understand about Jesus using terms that were not found in the gospel. Terms that explain the gospel, remain faithful to the gospel. The terms always had to be checked in comparison to the gospels, to the scriptures. It had to be faithful to the scripture. That we call, of course, on the tra tradition. It's the tradition of the church very gradually developing and explaining an understanding of Jesus. What we understand today about Jesus, Jesus is truly God. There are three persons in one God. Again, the idea back in those days, well, this is a divine person, but not a human person. No. We can't deny the humanity of Jesus. We can't deny the divinity of Jesus. And that's what they had to cope with. How do we understand these things? They had to use new language to help us understand it. And so now as we continue on with this, is to recognize that many of the leaders of the church now, depending upon where they are in history, are now leading with these ideas that Jesus is human and divine, and it's affecting their way of thinking, their way of ruling, their way, of course, of praying. As far as the people in the pews went, how did they help? Well, all these documents, all these heresies, they might have begun with some leader in the church, but they received their power through the people who accepted it. One of the interesting things I was reading somewhere, it said, what do the people of the pews think about this? The first answer is there was no such thing as pews in those days. They would stand around and worship in groups. They would be standing throughout the Eucharistic liturgy, for instance. It was many centuries before pews became something common in the churches. And so they didn't have pews. And yet at the same time, we mean the ordinary people, the people who are accepting Jesus as human and divine as one of the Trinity. So what was happening right now is we see how history is affecting the thinking in the church, how history affected the de development of theology, how it affects our thinking today, how the history always is saying we have to remain faithful to the scripture. We can never go against the scripture. But how do we explain the scripture for people as each growing generation or changing generation? And that's what the church is about in so many different ways. It's still a church existing in history, trying to the, bring the peace of Christ into history, but trying to understand who Jesus Christ really is in relationship to his divinity and his humanity. In our next session, we'll continue on seeing how the belief in Jesus had affected the way of life of many of the people. At the beginning, we looked and said, well, they had enough faith to go through persecution. Some didn't do it very well. And then we see how they were favored. But even when they became a favored religion, they human nature got into play. There were some who became very arrogant, perhaps. Some who were very faithful. And some who really became saintly in the new teachings, a new understanding of Jesus, a deeper understanding of Jesus. And so we'll be going next and to see how many religious practices arose from the people's understanding of Jesus. May the light of Christ lead me, the power of Christ be with me, the wisdom of Christ inspire me, the word of Christ instruct me, the shelter of Christ protect me. <laughs>
the hand of Christ hold me, and the love of Christ be in me. May the grieving find support in me, the sad find joy in me, the depressed find hope in me, the weak find strength in me, the doubters find faith in me, the rejected find love in me, and the world find Christ in me. And may Almighty God bless you, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.